In biology class, you probably had the same experience I had, where you're forced to remember the steps of the Krebs cycle, glycolysis, the electron transport chain, and other metabolic pathways. But have you ever stopped to consider what the point of all of this is? Today, I'm here to tell you not only why learning the Krebs cycle and its metabolic pathway friends is not only worth your time, but also change the very way you view your relationship with the food that you eat. Not only that, my goal for this video is to make it a companion for learners of metabolism. I'll be adding context, intuition, the whys and the hows behind the processes that seem to be arbitrarily handed down from nature. Your cell is actually a brilliant alchemist, and understanding the combination of individual details and themes of what it can do allows us to learn and apply it to a great deal of things. Keep looking for this theme throughout this entire video. With this, the memorization will feel more like remembering all of the Pokemon names instead of cramming one night before an exam. Memorization isn't without merit either. It allows you to easily form patterns and connections, allowing you to solve problems quicker as opposed to spending time learning it all over again. Our exploration of metabolism starts with a question we've all probably heard of. Why is eating highly processed sugary food bad for us? And not only that, we'll also bust another myth along with this. Eating carbs is unhealthy and will make you obese. What we commonly think of as processed sugar is sucrose, and it is made of fructose and glucose. They have exactly the same chemical formula, but have completely different shapes. Glucose is fine and all, it's found in bread, rice, noodles, and all those starchy goodies. But fructose can potentially cause problems. But why? Paradoxically in biochemistry, the answer to one question is usually found by answering another question. In this case, we should ask, how does glucose get processed inside of your cells, and how is this different from fructose? So how does this work? The overall idea is pretty simple. We burn glucose along with oxygen into CO2, water, and a whole lot of energy stored in the form of ATP. ATP is quite literally the energy currency of your cells. Except, it's not that simple. This reaction is actually spread over three big pathways, composed of over 20 individual steps. That's a lot of details, so let's simplify it down a lot. But in a moment, you'll see why and when we should start caring about the little details of these pathways, because it's within these steps that the difference between fructose and glucose becomes clear. But sometimes the overwhelming detail does definitely pose you a question, right? Does nature actually just want to torture us biochem students? Or is there a deeper reason here? Glycolysis breaks down glucose into smaller carbons while letting off a bit of energy. The Krebs cycle extracts the rest of that energy, leaving behind the sugar's corpse in the form of CO2. The smaller energy packages move towards the electron transport chain, turning the energy in those packages into pumping a dam full of hydrogens while using oxygen to complete the circuit. Once the floodgates open, the flow of hydrogen is used to recharge ATP. And with that, you will have extracted the energy from glucose and stored it within ATP. The first two pathways are collectively known as central metabolism. This design is very clever too. If the last two steps are overcrowded or lacking oxygen, glycolysis has its own way of completing the circuit and generating backup ATP instead of using the electron transport chain. This makes lactic acid in humans, but makes alcohol and yeast. This is called fermentation, and that's how we make beer. As you've just seen, these systems aren't blindly assembling or disassembling these molecules. They sense and feedback control one another to ensure optimal energy and material usage. Wait, hold on a second, but how are these reactions concerted so well in the mess that is the cell? What kind of black magic is this? what conducts and controls the chemical reactions inside of the cell. Almost every step of metabolism is facilitated by something known as enzymes. They are molecular machines of the cell that can pick apart and assemble molecules. Fructose is able to evade a very important enzymatic step. The speed of glycolysis is mainly controlled using an enzyme known as PFK. It controls the speed by sensing the energy balance of the cell through the amount of ATP and various other molecules, including citrate. The very same citrate behind the name citric acid cycle, 
also known as the crep cycle. If the crep cycle is running a lot already, then we don't really need any more glucose processed from glycolysis. So we should slow it down and divert glucose for storage as glycogen. This is how glucose is regulated as a fuel source. Fructose bypasses all of this by entering after the PFK step. Not a problem if you don't eat too much, but if you do, all of this will push the second half of glycolysis into overdrive, making these two, pyruvate and acetyl-CoA. Since the Krebs cycle is either fully on or off, acetyl-CoA will be used as material for synthesizing fat. Excess pyruvate directs to fatty acid synthesis, cholesterol, making LDLs, which is also known as bad cholesterol, so you don't want to mess with that stuff. Note that if you take a look at the chemical structures of the Krebs cycle and count the carbons, you'll see that acetyl-CoA is completely burnt into CO2. So once anything becomes acetyl-CoA, there's no way to turn that back into sugar. That includes all the fat you've just made from fructose. The only way to get rid of it is quite literally to breathe it out when you're exercising. That's how you lose body mass, by the way. You will literally breathe out the mass. This is when knowledge of the specific structures of the chemicals start to become a little bit more important and can't really be ignored anymore. So I'll start showing them a little bit more often than before. Too much fructose can be pretty bad for you, so you must eat it in moderation or exercise it off. As you can see, by knowing the steps, components, and control of these three pathways, you can understand which sources of nutrients are beneficial or not for you with nuance and context in mind. The specific order of chemicals in these steps can be the difference between a disease-ridden diet and a healthy one. This is why accurate memory is important in these fields of work. However, this is only the surface of the importance of the Krebs cycle. But before I tell you all of that, I'd like to reiterate that this video is only a companion for the courses. It's not a replacement for putting in the elbow grease through exercises and word problems. But luckily for us, our sponsor for this video, Brilliant.org, has one of the best and most unique ways to teach you the concepts and intuitions while tricking you into putting in the elbow grease. Brilliant is where you learn by doing, with thousands of interactive lessons in math, data analysis, programming, and AI. Their first principles approach of learning things from the ground up is one I personally use to learn the concepts behind these videos. The difference is, Brilliant makes these hands-on and interactive, essentially making them fun video games that 6x's your ability to learn compared to lectures. Award-winning teams of teachers, researchers, and professionals from MIT, Caltech, Duke, Microsoft, and Google, and more are the people behind these awesome lessons. This all works because it helps build your critical thinking skills through problem solving and not memorizing. So while you're building knowledge on specific topics, you'll also become a better thinker. Brilliant has an amazing list of new content on a wide range of topics that we explored in this video, including math, programming, data, and AI courses designed to build real skills and develop your intuition. So with Brilliant, you can now build and use formulas to solve real world problems in business and everyday life. Peek under the hood of large language models such as ChatGPT to understand concepts powering today's technology. To try everything Brilliant has to offer for free, a full 30 days, visit brilliant.org slash nanorooms or scan the QR code on the screen. You can also click the link in the description and you'll also get 20% off an annual premium subscription. Now back to the video. All of these pathways are controlled and modulated using enzymes, but where do these enzymes come from? Most enzymes are little molecular machines made of proteins and proteins are built using amino acids. These amino acids are chained together like little Lego bricks to form what will become the protein. Each of these amino acids in the chain have special properties that allow them to interact with one another within the chain to form a 3D structure of the enzyme, which determines its functionalities. The beautiful mechanisms were explained in depth in previous videos, but this video will concern the amino acids themselves. Let's go back to central metabolism and look at the structures of these chemicals and compare them with amino acids. Do you feel that these look oddly similar? As if you can convert between one and the other. That's right, the Krebs cycle and glycolysis aren't just meant for sugar metabolism. These pathways are not excessively built. The little extra steps are just entry points for various other compounds. I'd like you to take a step back here and imagine yourself as an early biochemist discovering these things. 
If you have the structures of the chemicals vividly behind in the back of your head, the more likely you will be to make those connections and potentially solve a problem or discover something new. Your intuition can be boosted multiple fold when your memory is doing the heavy lifting for you. Fat is also part of this equation. As you've seen earlier, fatty acids can get broken down into acetyl-CoA, which can enter the Krebs cycle and be burnt off. It's not nature torturing you. It's nature designing an incredibly versatile system that is robust against various nutrient sources. The proteins you eat from food can get shredded into amino acids, and these can either be used for building your own molecular machines or burnt into energy through the Krebs cycle. This process of breaking down raw ingredients into energy is known as catabolism. But if you can destroy, you can also build. This is known as anabolism. These two opposing forces can be controlled using signals and enzymes. When your cell needs a lot of molecular machines, build muscle, or respond to signals, amino acids are anabolized instead of catabolized. This pathway of synthesizing amino acids and another alternate pathway for glucose can combine together to form nucleotides, the building blocks of DNA, RNA, and energy storage molecules such as ATP. Not only that, if you look at the chemicals in central metabolism, you can actually turn these back into glucose through a pathway known as gluconeogenesis. This happens in the liver when it senses that your brain is starved of energy since it can't survive without glucose. This is also why telling people to stop eating carbs is kind of a bad idea. If you only ate fat and proteins, your liver would need extra effort to turn the amino acids into glucose. Eating carbs is fine so long as it's glucose and or not in excess. Note that the material from acetyl-CoA has no access to any of this, since all of it is still lost as CO2. Your cells have the sheer versatility to process various forms of fat, protein, and carbs and turn them into energy or other forms they might need. This is why you are taught glucose metabolism first. It covers the pathways that are at the center of all metabolism. This is why it's called central metabolism. This is your cell as an alchemist, and at its center is the Krebs cycle. But not only do the many steps of these pathways solve a material problem, it also solves an energy problem too. The biggest reason why your cells aren't glorified furnaces is that if you have only one step, most of that energy will be released as heat. Having little steps allows the energy to be released more controllably and slowly, so you end up with a more usable energy. This theme is actually something you will have encountered in thermodynamics, recall the reversible and irreversible processes you've learned. In fact, thermodynamics is quite literally the main driving force behind life itself. A lot of themes and designs in metabolism you've seen today are done with the second law of thermodynamics as the constraint. Every process in your cells maximizes the entropy of the universe one way or the other. A healthy exercise for any learner would be to try to understand why each step of the pathway has to happen and how it impacts entropy. But, well, why is this law so fundamental and how does it restrict life's designs? But not only that, why does order and complexity arise if all the reactions just favor entropy? You'll have to find out in the next video dropping in two months. I'll see you soon. Subscribe.